Hello and welcome back to Sean in the Shed. On the show today, we've got Gonzalo Hall, who's the co-founder of Remote Europe. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Excited. And you're joining us from the Canary Islands. Uh, you do a lot of traveling around, but you're originally from Lisbon, from Portugal. Uh, but we yeah. always start out the show by describing where you were born, educated, and how you started out in your career. So, Gonzalo, if you could share that with the audience, that'd be much appreciated. So that looks like it was a, a century ago, but I was born in Lisbon and I was raised in Lisbon until I was, I was 18. As soon as I got my freedom, I started moving around first to Porto, then to Algarve and then to the world. Uh, so I was kind of born a nomad, I guess. I always wanted to explore how we used to live in the X place. And it could be Algarve, it could be UK, it could be anywhere. I was always very curious about the life in these different places. So that's why I kept moving even from school to school, to, from university to university. My background, which is my last degree, uh, is on marketing, um, marketing management, but I, I work on it as a passion. So right now I'm just a founder, a founder of Remote Europe, Remote Portugal, Future of Work Conferences, and everything basically related with remote work. And yeah, my professional background is now very, very related with helping companies, people and governments into transition to these new worlds of uh, remote work and future of work and this flexibility that we now have. Let's start by talking about your podcast. Perhaps you can describe what the podcast covers to the audience. Yes, that's a great. Thank you. And so my podcast, the first thing I did when I became an entrepreneur uh, around one year and some months ago was to launch my podcast. Uh, I was having in my previous job a lot of interesting conversations with startup founders, with remote founders, remote HR managers, and I really wanted to share that knowledge to the world. And I also acknowledge that for a lot of people, remote work is just one individual working remotely or for a company, it was just a bad. So I really wanted to share everything that's remote work movement. I wanted to share the people in New Mexico that are re-educating the, um, the, the mine workers that lost their jobs and now they are re-educating them and managing them to get remote jobs. I want to talk about a co-living uh, ex-advisor from a White House in the US that now has a co-living space in uh, Bali, uh, Outpost. I wanted to share all these amazing people that are part of the remote work movement and somehow they are not, people are not talking about them because it's not obvious. So my podcast, Remote Work Movement, is about me interviewing, like you are doing here, Chan, me interviewing amazing people from all over the world doing something amazing through remote work. And how popular has remote work become? Because before the pandemic, people were demanding flexible working, but it was not the majority of uh, knowledge workers, was it? Talk us through some no. of the statistics and how that shifted. So there is not yet uh, official statistics, but I speak with a lot of HR ma managers as a remote work consultant, and they are all doing uh, inquiries uh, inside their walls, so to make sure what actually people want. So. Even though we had a very bad experience with remote work, remote work is not staying inside a house 24 seven, definitely with your family, with your kids. Remote work is working from co-working spaces, cafes, anywhere actually. So even though all that difficulties, even though all that trauma from staying at home, uh, the results of all these questionnaires is 60 to 80% of the people that can work for remotely, they want to work remotely. So 60 to 80% are demanding in a nice way, I want the freedom to work from anywhere. So yeah, what most companies are doing right now, uh, most companies that can, again, is actually going to a hybrid solution. So they are reducing the office space to around 50 to 30% and they are letting who wants uh, work remotely and who wants to stay around. They are staying around the office and they use it like kind of a co-working space for, for all the employees. But we are seeing a huge change in the market right now and the numbers will be incredible to see after the first studies in the guest next year. And it's going to mean a lot when it comes to things like social mobility. So for example, Facebook, uh, they're allowing their staff to move outside of San Francisco and Silicon Valley where it's more expensive, but perhaps they're going to reduce their salary uh, while staff uh, are quite cool with that. Um, what are the trends and, and uh, uh, other types of change are we going to see because of this, uh, this shift in the way that we work? It's incredible to see how everything is just a, a circle. So we moved to cities to get access to information jobs and now we are moving 
away from cities because we can work remotely. So what's happening right now, slowly still, because there is not clarity about most of most companies will do, but Facebook, Twitter, Quora, they announced that it will allow people to work remotely forever. So we are seeing people actually going away from big cities, leaving big cities because they are looking for a cheaper life and also more quality of life. Uh, we lost a lot of quality uh, of life in order to move to a big city. We lost access to the nature, the access to green stuff, I actually just have parks around. and. People want this more relaxed lifestyle. People want to have still have access to the culture, but at the same time, they want to move out of the stress of London, for example, taking one hour or two hour commutes. We don't want that anymore. So the first thing we are seeing is actually people are leaving big cities. They are, one, they are basically moving to smaller cities or to the cities where their parents, uh, their parents are still living there. And we are seeing this return to the roots, which is very interesting as a social factor for me. Me personally, being from Portugal, the rural areas from Portugal are completely abandoned. Everybody moved to, Porto, to Lisbon and to, or to Porto. And right now, slowly, we are seeing people moving back, people buying houses in the nature. Even if it's one hour and a half away from Lisbon, in one hour, Portugal is so small that in one hour and a half, you can be in a diff totally different part of the country if we're surrounded by nature or in the big waves of Nazaré, you can pretty much be around. So the first thing is people, it will see the decentralization of people finally and this will lead to smaller prices in the real estate in the center we'll see offices being very different like in compared with what they were they will not be the place to work they will be the place to connect so people still go to the office now and then to connect with the whole team but that will be the exception that you will go to visit the office of your company to connect uh, to some social event not to do the work and then everything will change if we are around uh smaller cities maybe our parents maybe where our all our friends were before will have deeper connections in when you move to a big city i move a lot so when i move to a big city you start from zero and sometimes it's really hard to make connections outside work and that's why some people say remote work is is loneliness but it doesn't have to be if you are in your social infrastructure if you are surrounded by the people you know so i think everything will change even migration we touched a little bit on this but migration i think if you are someone from africa that is educated you don't have to move to Europe to get a job anymore. You can be in Nigeria, in Kenya, and have a great job in a big company in Europe. So, and you, the money you will spend will stay in your country. So imagine you are from Nigeria, you have a job in Germany, the 3K that you are winning, 3K euros, will be spent in Nigeria, in the economy, in local entrepreneurs. I think remote work will change everything, pretty much. That's why I'm so in love with it and the change that will bring to the world. <coughs> It is quite profound, isn't it? Because we could see this rise of Africa and the redistribution of wealth. Um, perhaps you can talk about the new website that you've got, which is Remote Europe, and describe uh, what that does. Yes, yeah, so Remote Europe. Remote Europe, we found the big issue on people that were looking for remote jobs in Europe, which is when you go to big sites like we work remotely, around 80% of the jobs in the end, in small letters, say US only. And we question ourselves, so why is this happening? Why it's so hard to find a remote job as an European? Why do we have to go against so many walls as an Europeans to get a remote job? So as I like to do, we fight back. So I created Remote Europe, remoteeurope.com, remote slash europe.com. And it's basically, it's starting as a job board. So if you go there right now, you can see around 100 uh, open jobs for you, open positions, open for Europeans. Some of them are global. Uh, but they are all open for Europeans. And that's how we start. But to be honest, that's just the first step. We want to conquer Europe and we want to change everything. One thing I notice in Portugal, because I am promoting remote work for one year in Portugal and really pushing the movement here, is that with more education, more companies feel better about this move. More companies feel that they have the information they need to work remotely. So we are trying to do the same in Europe. So we will create a huge hub of information, bringing the best companies to speak, online events, a lot of articles as well, in order to make sure that every single company that wants to have more information about how to work remotely, they can find it at Remote Europe. Next, we want to change policies. I didn't know this, but in countries like Germany, if you work more than X amount of days remotely, you pay more taxes. It was like, 
<laughs> what's happening? <laughs> and we're in 2020. So one of the goals as well is to change and create a European policy or at, le at least European guidelines for remote work. And it's important to say that we are European as 50 countries, not as European Union. Uh, we love European Union, but there is much more Europe outside the European Union. There is Ukraine, there is a lot of, even Turkey, really good countries with a lot of interesting companies. So we want to help everyone, uh, not just the political side of it. No, that's really interesting. If you've just joined us, you're watching Sean in the Shed. And on the show today, we've got Gonzalo Hall, who is the co-founder of Remote Europe and uh, is very passionate about remote working. <laughs> so if you've got friends, family, contacts and others that might be interested in this video, do tag them in the comment stream. And you can hashtag share Sean in the Shed on social media. If you're interested in coming on the show, you can direct message me uh, on LinkedIn. But the question that myself and Gonzalo would like to ask you, the audience today, is how will remote work change the world? If you've got questions, answers or opinion on that, do fill in the comment stream. But let's fire that question back to Gonzalo now. Um, how will remote work change the world? We've talked about some of the changes. Um, yeah. Some of the changes with remote work are obvious. There's less of a commute. Maybe life is simpler and you're closer to your immediate family. Uh, but what are the less obvious uh, changes and, and, and how will it change the world? Will it change the world for the good or for the bad? I am sure if well done, it can change the world to further goods. And some of the things I really love about remote work is surprisingly how much more connected we are with who we are and with the people around us. So when you don't have to forcefully connect with the people with whom you work with, which for example, again, if you move to London, you kind of are forced into the remote, the, the community of your company, you have to make friends there or else you'll have a lot of time. And right now, you basically have to have to leave everything that were the place where you grew, your friends, your family to go to a big place. That will stop being a reality. So finally, we will see the rural world becoming the best place to live and instead of just abandoned. But there is economic, and economically, it will change everything. It will be an equalizer in the, uh, into the, into the, and the wages, for example. If someone from South America can work for a company in the US, they will have a better wage and it will change the whole economy. There was one study just like three, four years ago that one person that gets a very high wage in the rural area, they can get even up to 10 jobs around them. So grocery shops, cafes, one person with a high salary can get 10 jobs around them. If you multiply that to a whole community of remote workers that are moving back to all these old villages, the economic impact is so great that it's almost immense, it's almost, it looks like an utopia right now. But then again, the social side for me is what passions me also about because for suddenly we have access to all these jobs and we also have access to different communities. I travel the world all the time. Right now I'm in Las Canarias and I can connect with Spanish, I can learn Spanish, I can feel the isle, the island life. Next I can go to Mexico and understand how Mexico think in Latin. So imagine that you are a salesperson. That changed the way you think really, really strongly. If you want to understand how LATAM thinks, you can go to LATAM and live there for six months and will understand everything you learn Spanish. So I think the personal growth that will come with remote work has the potential to be huge as well as you will have the space to learn more. You will have the time to learn more because if you take that two, three hours commute every day, you have three more hours to learn, to grow yourself, to be, to do exercise, for example, all that. Uh, well, it will change everything. It's, it's like almost impossible to explain in, in less than 30 minutes what will change. But basically the whole potential that remote work has to change the world to and poverty in some ways with the right education to just give more access to jobs to everyone. Because we have these big communities like Lisbon, London with lack of people to work in IT. And we have countries like Mexico uh, providing really good education to, uh, to, new, uh, to new students that are studying IT. And these people have to move to big countries to get a job. Now that's not true anymore. A small country can just bet a lot of money in their education system and they will have the outcome of that kind of really fast ROI, to be honest, uh, compared with what was before. So that's great news for pretty much everyone. The rise of remote work, things like video conferencing, has been good because, you know, there's less pollution and there's less travel, uh, you know, commuter time. But is it going to devastate uh, travel, uh, you know, the transport industry, the infrastructure? 
is traveling going to become more expensive because there's quite simply less people traveling and there's less demand? I don't think there will be less people traveling. I think we'll see a change, a change of the people who are traveling and also the amount of time. So I think business travel is pretty much that, <laughs> to be honest. I don't think anyone will think about traveling to Dubai for having a meeting when they can do a, just a Zoom call of half an hour and have 20 more calls in the same day instead of losing three days in one meeting. Uh, at the same time, I think more people will have the freedom to work. I think more people can just come to la like the Canary Islands and work from here for a couple of months. More people can choose where they want to work. So I think we'll see a big difference in the people who will be traveling. But I think people have the freedom to travel more. Imagine if I see that there's something interesting happening in the, nor in the north of UK, I can just travel there for a week, work from there, and I don't have to take vacations. So we can travel more. We have just more freedom to do it. And we will, we will stop the stupid traveling just for meetings, which is great, in my opinion, for environment. It might be worth talking about how some of the big companies do remote work, uh, like Automatic, the, uh, the makers of uh, WordPress or GitLab, um, because some people are thinking, well, you know, with remote work, it's more transactional. It's actually a challenge to build relationships. Um, so could you describe how some of the bigger companies that are doing uh, remote work at scale, uh, overcome some of these difficulties around building relationships, for example? Yes, that's very interesting because what most companies are doing right now is transforming all their meetings into Zoom meetings. And there is a very interesting story from the CEO at Doist, which is another very big remote company, uh, that he was having an interview uh, with uh, one big um, American news outlet. And in the end of the interview, he was just complaining, oh, I have such a busy week, it's insane. And when he was asked, oh, but how many meetings do you have this week? I have five. And it was like, most of the people I know have more than five meetings in the morning. And he had five meetings in one week. That to say that the companies that are doing this for a long time, all the base of the remote work is asynchronous communication. So this means my many, many less uh, meetings. This means that we'll have less conversations happening, but at the same time, more interesting communication going in the right places. The second thing is that people are focusing, and there is a lot of new startups like Atium focusing on this, in building the social games, the ping pong table that I used to have in my last office, they are transitioning this to the online world. So in the last month, I did escape rooms, I played games, and I did all these fun things with my teams all over the world. And to be honest, we are building great relationships. So one of the things that all these companies do is they leave space both in their communication tool and online uh, on the video tools to create to the creation of relationships. This is very important to everyone. And to be honest, and I will give an example, the Future of Work conferences, we worked together for one year. I just met my team for the first time three weeks ago, and it was like they were family. And I felt the same thing in my last company. They were fully remote. We meet almost every day for 10 minutes. They were like family again. So you can build relationships alone uh, online. But the thing is, you have to be purposeful when you are creating these relationships. There is no coffee machine talk. You have to create the space in the schedule of the workers to create these social interactions that happen by chance on the office. Online, you need to create the space, both with games, with social uh, times. I have a company that does online meditation every single day at 9 a.m. So everyone connects who wants and they do meditation together for 20 minutes. All those little things is how you will build culture in these remote companies. And this is how we'll, people will get together. And honestly, looking at companies like GitLab, I never seen so many people in love with their company like I see on GitLab, on Buffer, on Automatic, in all these remote companies. People really dress the t-shirt, uh, like we say in Portugal, and they put the flag out, I love to work here. You don't see that very often in, uh, on, in office uh, companies. And uh, writing skills when you're working remotely are a lot more important. Um, can you describe to the audience when it's appropriate to go asynchronous and, and send emails and, and type or, or, you know, do the asynchronous communication versus syncing up and, and jumping on those video calls? So as an example, and I'll, and I'll tell you this, um, one of the first rules I implement in all the companies I consult with is 
it's forbidden internal email. I don't allow internal email in the companies I consult with because one of the issues that we have in most companies is too many channels for communication. So some things go through email, some things go to Slack or through Teams. And when you want to look for information, it's just a mess. So I always advise an uh, internal single tool for communication, usually Slack, Twist, Twim, Teams, Microsoft Teams. Uh, so that's how we start. But then, like you said, most I would say 95% of the whole communication is asynchronous by the written form. And this is then first in these tools, second on the project management tool, a Zen, a Trello, whatever you are using, and also in the documentation. Documentation is key for every company. All of them is in the written form, right? So written has become the new speaking English. I think if you write proper English and if you speak okay English, now it's more it's easier than ever to get a job than before when you just you have to speak to go by. So that is very, very different. When it's I think to be honest, synchronous video calls, in my opinion, are mostly for building relationships. It's very hard to build relationships through the written form because of tone of voice and there is no f visual feedback. I see the meetings uh, as an excuse to build relationships. Oh, yeah, let's have a weekly meeting with the whole team. For me, we can speak about work, but I'm building relationships. Uh, it's not about work. The work we can do asynchronously. The dailies that a lot of teams have, they can be done asynchronously on Loom, for example, and, and everyone speaks to Loom and says what they have done in the last day. We do the meetings, in my opinion, in remote teams, just to connect the workers, and that's pretty much it. And I suppose one of the advantages of asynchronous communication is, on the one hand, you've got managers who want to do 30-minute, one-hour meetings, and then you've got the makers who love the deep work. So going async can help um, calm people down when it comes to that conflict management between what the manager wants and what the actual knowledge worker wants that's creating product or... Uh, getting on with the job at hand, I suppose. Um, yes. That's really interesting. I love that article. Let's turn our attention to the crisis now. Um, what's it, what is the situation like uh, in the Canary Islands? Uh, what, what's it like in Portugal? Uh, and um, how long do you think we're going to be doing this remote working gig for? Forever. Uh, <laughs> no, I think... The, in the crisis side of it, I think, yeah, we lost a lot of companies for sure. Even we have here someone from a co-working space. We lost a lot of co-working spaces because they had to pay rent and they were closed. So that was a big stress. And we are definitely losing part of the economy. But I still think we are going through it quite well because I was not expecting that companies could adapt so fast to remote work. Most of them are not adapting in a super positive way to that something that could be sustainable long term. But most of them adapted quite fast. Even big companies like uh, this consultancy, like Deloitte, for example, they were a little bit against remote work, a lot about against remote work. And suddenly they are all working remotely quite successfully. Uh, so here in Canary Islands, things are changing. There is a big movement to promote remote work. First, to promote, to attract remote workers like myself to the islands, to promote the economy here. But also, I see people every day leaving the Canary Islands, people who was born here, grew up here. Just a friend of mine is moving to Barcelona because he got a job in Barcelona and he, had to, he has to move there to do the job. So, in terms of COVID, things are insane in Spain. Somehow, this country has more cases than everyone else all the time. But besides that, the tourist economy is pretty much dead everywhere, even though the Canary Islands are quite open. The hotels, and this is a destiny with for mass tourism. So tourism is suffering a lot, but companies are being built. Uh, new. I, th I love crisis because in all the crises, you see a lot of new entrepreneurs just rising and shining and new businesses. And you see more people here trying, thinking about building co-working and co-living spaces, more companies starting SaaS products. And I think this is great. So crises are bad for the short term, but long term, they are for sure the biggest opportunity that you can have as a single person and a future entrepreneur. And do you think when the vaccine is rolled out and the crisis dies down and the pandemic ends, that people will revert back to going to the office and, and back to the old habits? Or do you think remote work is here to stay? I think some managers will try it. And by trying it, they will lose all the best employees to the companies that are already thinking about long-term implementation of remote work. 
uh, right now, if you don't offer remote work or if you're not thinking about offering remote work, there is no way you can hire a hay player to your company. It's almost impossible because even it's not about living anywhere. It's about the flexibility to live where we want. If we want, we can still live in London, but we choose to live in London. We are, it's not mandatory that you move there. So if you are a big company and you are not implementing remote work and you want all your employees to go back to the office, there is a study just before the crisis that says that two in every three employees will change their work in, with the opportunity to get a remote job. So basically, you are in to lose two er, in every three employees that get an offer to work remotely. With more and more companies work remotely, I think that will be quite easy to find in the future. So get ready to lose most of your good employees if you decide to stay in office and it will not be beautiful. So yeah, adapt fast. I think this is a great opportunity for small companies that are adapting fast and saying, we are going fully remote, please come and work for us. And what about the whole geographic uh, constraints around jobs? Because uh, the war for talent demands, you know, talent demands that people work remotely. Uh, the net for talent, the fishing net is much bigger. Uh, but does that make it then harder for small companies to compete with large companies that can pay the high salaries? Or um, what does it do to competition in the marketplace? Is it is it all boats rising together because th there's just more people to go at? Or what are the trends are you seeing in the marketplace when it comes to jobs? Because I guess with your remote Europe hat yeah. on, you're running a, a remote uh, job board. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I think we are leaving a very big aspect of work outside of the remote work conversation, not just us, but everyone, which is culture. I think culture will still play a huge role in the hiring scene. I think Portuguese companies will still hire mostly Portuguese people for the jobs because their market is Portugal. Uh, of course, if you are a global company, that is totally different, but small companies are usually much more localized. So I think the local talent will still be preferred. I don't think we'll see huge wars for that. Of course, if you are a Portuguese company and a Facebook comes saying, hey, you can work with a US salary, people will leave and this will bring some problems. But again, I think surprisingly, most Portuguese will still prefer to work for Portuguese companies if they offer that flexibility. Like people in Germany will always prefer to speak German every day. People in France, the same. Uh, so I think we'll see, mm, I think the fight will not be that big. I think US and UK can still can still steal talent from any country because everyone uh, can speak English They will, and they can pay more. But I don't see this huge war for talent that everyone will go to small ship countries like uh, Bangladesh and hire everyone in Bangladesh. I think the risk of hiring someone from a totally different cult culture right away without a proper culture fit your company, specifically for smaller companies, is not worth it. It's more worth to hire someone, for example, from Europe or Africa, than go to Bangladesh and hire someone because it's $500 cheaper. Uh, so I think the culture we actually play a huge paper of huge role in all this, and most it's not part of the conversation, but it's a very important one. As we come towards the end of the show, there'll be plenty of managers, owners, and leaders thinking about how we're going to get through this recession. Um, so within the context of remote work, Gonzalo, what are your top three tips uh, for our audience for getting through this uh, recession and, and this crisis? So for me. I would, I would separate it in two. The first to the companies, founders, etc. Go for remote. Remote, you know all the benefits. I will not let you know. You know all the challenges. I don't need to speak about them. But if you set up your communication, your documentation, and your project management properly, you will gain productivity. You will hire people anywhere in your country or in Europe or in the world. So that's the, just a smart move to do. If you are an individual, my my advice is actually totally different, is learn more about yourself. I think right now we just went with the flow and we have now the time to learn more about yourself. Do a personality test. I always do with people in my trainings, the 16personality.com. Uh, it's a Meyer Briggs test and learn about yourself and learn about this new world, learn about the new tools because all these this is just the biggest opportunity in the market. So if you want to work remotely, if you want to experience a different lifestyle, if you want to go back and live in the nature, you need to have the, all these new skills. So learn about yourself, check what is your strength as point, 
and go get the education and go get it. I think the market is open for everyone, for entrepreneurs. Do you have a huge freelancer scene just exploding all over the world? And yeah, just go and get it. Like it was never as easy as now to get a new opportunity and to get a new career because things are changing insanely fast. Some really good points. Thanks for that, Gonzalo. In terms of uh, connecting with you, you're you're on LinkedIn, so people can connect with you there. What what are the other methods for connecting with you? For me, LinkedIn is like the king. It's my favorite platform all over the world. And if you want to follow what, what everything I do, they will, it will appear on LinkedIn. If you really don't like LinkedIn, then you probably shouldn't be seeing this. But if you don't like LinkedIn, <laughs> you can always contact me through my email. It's Gonzo at remoteworkmovement.com. I don't promise answers to everyone because usually I don't, but if you are interesting and you make a good point, you may get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really good. And have you got a busy evening ahead? What are you up to? So I have actually a lot of calls today. Somehow everyone decided to organize conferences in the same week. I'm not sure what's happening this week. So I'm speaking like three conferences a day right now. And then I go to the beach. Uh, my girlfriend has volleyball practice. We play both beach volleyball. So yeah, just chilling by the end of the day, watch some beach volleyball, maybe with a beer and just relax for the rest of the day. That's, that sounds fantastic. Uh, obviously, the weather's a lot better there than uh, here yes. in England. But, uh, <laughs> Gonzalo, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been really interesting learning about the whole movement around remote work and your passion for it is, uh, is fantastic. So thanks for educating us all about the benefits. And thank you to you, the audience, for watching Sean in the Shed. Have a great evening now, everyone, and speak to you later on.